Well, we've seen some dumb bunnies so far, haven't we? But these are the dumbest of all, the hitchhikers. Why? Well, even if the driver doesn't mean any harm, and you're just plain lucky if he doesn't, he may be a reckless driver or a speeder. His car might have bad brakes. The hitchhiker doesn't know. He just goes right along anyway. Well, these kids aren't going to be so lucky. Too bad. They ask for trouble and they're getting it. But thank goodness, one of the boys kept his head. He took the license number of the car. And another boy saw a squad car coming down the next street. I always say that Sin is the bad cop of mental hygiene. You know, he was he was the big fist. You know, Sid was the guy who did who made films that that the big educational producers wouldn't touch with a ten foot pole. I'd thought that Sid made about 20 or 30 films and as it turned out he made about 150. No, Jimmy's all right, but I'm not so sure about Marcia. Oh no. Any safety films with Sid Davis are are great. Because safety films for other film companies have to do with teaching you certain rules and helping you understand that if you do this, this might happen or this, this could happen to you. With Sid Davis, if you go beyond a trespassing sign, you fall down a cliff. Okay, that's about it. Well, Sid Davis was the king of calamity. I mean, that was his, that was his ooh, uh, whatever is the word they use nowadays. to be a director just by being the stand-in over a period of years. You learn everything. But when people find out I stand in for John Wayne, you think I was a big hero. I was only a stand-in. That's, uh, that's not making me a big actor. Here he comes this guy, this one-man production house, essentially, out of Hollywood, making films that are just as, as nasty, uh, in many cases, as, as I think the adults secretly wanted them to be. Public restrooms can often be a hangout for the homosexual. Bobby and his friends hadn't noticed the man who had been in the restroom when they changed, and as it was lady suggested, they take the shortcut under the pier, but the others preferred to take the more traveled way home. Bobby recognized the stranger as the man in the restroom. The shortcut under the pier didn't seem like a good idea at all. And this is the important thing, and this is the thing that makes me cringe when I see one of Sid's films and hear the audience around me breaking up. It isn't that they're not funny. Yes, they are by modern standards. 
but that's not a fair way to judge them. Hello, little lady. All alone, aren't you? Wouldn't you like I'll buy you some ice cream. Well, a lot of people laugh at them, and again, you know, they take them ironically or cynically or whatever, but like, move beyond that quickly. That won't get you anywhere. What Sid's films tell you is that the conventional wisdom that it used to be quieter, safer, and better for kids, you know, that things are terrible today, it's all wrong. In December of 1949, we had a child molesting case in Los Angeles. Well, my daughter was just six years old, so I tried to explain it to her. Put it in one ear and out the other. So I figured, hey, she's an average child and I'm an average parent. I should make a picture. I'm in a picture business to teach children how to be aware of strangers. So I told Duke about that. He said, hey, that's a great idea. So he gave me the money. We set up a company and I made the picture called The Dangerous Stranger. And it just took the country by storm. Well, nobody ever saw her again. It was in the headlines and on the radio. You probably heard it. The police believe she was kidnapped. They have no clues to the identity stranger in the shabby car. Nobody thought to take the license number of the car. And if you see any little girl... That's the, way it happened. the theory was, and it's still a theory that's believed by adults today, that, that kids will sort of pattern their behavior on what, according to what they see on a screen. Now today it's television or computer games. Back then, it was film. And so adults said, well, instead of showing you know, kids act, you know, delinquent kids. Why don't we show nice kids? Kids who, you know, follow the rules and obey their parents and are sweet and, and, and maybe a little confused, but basically nice kids, sort of a surrogate role model. Helen has trained herself to know what she's going to do in what order and where the things are to do it with. She really doesn't have to think about it. She already knows what clothes she's going to wear today. As it turned out, it was a special day for Helen, too. But she makes a habit of being ready for special days. She starts by having a place for things and keeping them there. She uses taste in selecting her clothes. But more than that, she keeps them clean and mended and she's able to match the right skirt with the right sweater. For other production companies, such as Coronet or Encyclopedia Britannica, they had to write a script with an educational collaborator and have that script approved. There's a definite uh, dialogue between what's going on in in the curriculum in the classroom and uh, what's going on on the screen. With Sid Davis, he's doing his own thing, period. I tried once to kick off the habit, but I was too far gone. You know, the police say, find a heroin addict and you find a criminal, and that's just about it. If you're hooked bad, it costs about $30 a day for H. Boys get the money by stealing or swiping car parts, maybe by holdups. Girls take up street walking or, or do what I did, become peddlers themselves. It's Sid Davis's vision. He did not have to go through a uh, script committee. He did not have an educational collaborator. He was not trying to follow a, a textbook. It's, it's just it's his idea about how the world works. Film producers such as Coronet and Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, they produced films on, it, on juvenile delinquency, but they're fairly nice films. Uh, they give kids a break. Their educational collaborators were talking about society and how it produces juvenile delinquency. Kids like this, not wanted by any other group or anyone else much, tend to hang out together. Kids like Joe Martin, he's hardly ever seen his mother sober. Mike Kelly, he has to show off all the time, try to get attention. His parents are dead. He lives with his older sister. To her, he's just another mouth to feed in her large family. Harry Jackson gets too much spending money from his people. Money, never any of their time. And Jerry Phillips, rejected by his stepmother, let down by his father. 
He's the loneliest of the lot. Well, Sid Davis doesn't even do that at all. It's like if you're a bad kid, you're a bad kid. And I think that reflects perhaps a mood in society at that time. Here's someone who's talking about it in his own voice, saying that, well, if you're a juvenile delinquent, you're, you're just a punk, and it's your choice. It's not that you, you, know, you were a product of society. You're just a product of your own bad behavior. As you watch him being tossed, your mind races. Thoughts tumble one upon the other. How unlike Jake are you? Can you continue the way you're going and stay out of trouble? You wish you knew. The Sid kind of came, rose up into prominence of the 50s, went into the 60s. And then mental hygiene got really mean um, with, you know, the drug films and the driver safety films. Basically, it was, again, it was sort of adults saying, well, you didn't listen, kids. You, you're, you're rebelling. You're still smoking pot and you're still, you know, you're carrying picket signs now. We don't like that. You have to remember that parents were scared back then. They, were, they didn't know what was going on. Kids were acting in weird ways and doing weird things. That, that, that they had no experience in dealing with. I mean, think about a, a, a parent or a teacher in 1953. You know, they grew up in the, what, the 20s? This is a whole new world for them. They didn't know. Kids were going crazy. Um, so what do you do? You try and move them in the right direction, but if they don't listen to you, then, then, you, then you, you pull a carrot back and you hit them with a stick. And, and Sid was the stick. Even now you're afraid. What will it be like? First you'll get a burn, that is a feeling of warmth will slip over you, and then you'll become nauseated and get desperately sick. Finally the retching will subside and you'll have a sustained feeling of sensual excitement which will lapse into a state of euphoria or well-being. But it won't last, and when you come down you'll be in the depth of depression, consumed by a cancer of guilt. For just one second, your conscience pricks as you see the needle inserted in the death-dealing liquid slipping in and mixing with Michael's blood. For a moment, you want to say no, but the will to resist is gone. Temptation is ever-present. The desire to try something new, something more powerful, is too great. But when they drove right past her house, she became concerned. When they arrived at Lookout Peak, she was frightened. She tried to convince herself there was nothing to worry about, but when they parked off the road, she knew she had gotten herself into something she couldn't handle. Girls Beware, I think, is groundbreaking because it talks about sex and rape directly. No sugarcoating. Uh, there's no fade to black. You see either, you either get a headline that the girl is dead or that her life is ruined forever. And that's a very, uh, to me, startling and shocking uh, film compared to what's going, what, what the films that are being produced at the same time with Encyclopedia Britannica and Centron and uh, Coronet. They're still talking about saw cops and dating and a girl shouldn't go uh, all the way and if you want to be popular, you shouldn't dress in a trampy way or wear, wear red nail polish. What Jimmy didn't know was that Ralph was sick. A sickness that was not visible like smallpox, but no less dangerous and contagious, a sickness of the mind. You see, Ralph was a homosexual, a person who demands an intimate relationship with members of their own sex. Wow, Sid really had an idea about how these things happened. I don't think necessarily this is the way that these things happened. For example, with Boys Beware, it's an elaborate uh, seduction for this, this. Here's this kid who gets some attention from a, a gentleman who looks somewhere between uh, someone like John Waters with these dark sunglasses and a real shady character. And the guy just doesn't abduct him. He takes him out fishing and hunting. I think they play putt-putt. They have sandwiches. And then they look at pornographic pictures together. And the next thing you know, there's just this pan, a slow pan to this guy leading the poor kid up to a, a motel room. And the result is, is the, the guy gets locked away, but the kid gets probation. I'm a young kid back in Temple Street, 
I don't know, 10, 11, 9, 10 or 11 years old. And I'm walking home uh, from the playground, and I live close to it. And uh, this, this other kid was quite a bit older, maybe six years older. He says, well, walk me to my house, and, uh, and, I'll, and I got some cake I'll give you. So, what the hell, get some cake, walk to the house. He's only up the street. When I got there, he tried to get me to, to uh, suck him. And, of course, I didn't want to do that. And uh, he was being pretty persistent, but I, but I was also persistent. And I said, my brother's going to beat you up and all that stuff. Anyway, so I got away from that, so I was lucky. Now Ethel is really on her own. I suppose just about here, the harsh laughs are starting in the audience. All right, go ahead and laugh. Of course, Ethel isn't laughing. She can almost hear all the warnings she never listened to about being picked up by strangers. And here's something really funny. Go ahead, have a good laugh. Sid's films allude to the uh, presence of darker forces lurking under the surface, especially kind of darker and more dangerous forces within the sunny world of Southern California. There's strangers lurking and danger lurking, you know, to grab kids, to corrupt them, to abduct them, maybe even to kill them, to seduce the innocent, you know, as one of his film titles goes. It's a consistent theme throughout his, uh, his work. The world is not friendly. If I describe Sid and his feelings about children, it begins to seem like a tiresome cliché, and yet it's true. Uh, I honestly think he had a, an overwhelming interest in helping kids. You know, there's always only one memory, one memory regarding discipline with him. And they never spanked me. You know, and I don't think I got into a lot of trouble. I think I was a pretty good kid. But I always remember this. My dad came home from work, and I was in my room. I don't know how old I was, four, three or four. And my mother had told me to straighten the dolls in my room. So I was in my room straightening the dolls. And my dad came home from work, and he... My mom probably told him I was in my room cleaning my room. So when he went into my room, he saw me, what he thought, playing with my dolls. And he spanked me because I wasn't cleaning my room. And then when he found out that he had made a mistake, <laughs> he apologized, which I always appreciated. But I've never forgotten that. But I think Sid has a lot of compassion for troubled kids. I mean, sometimes his films tend to speak really directly and mockingly and in your face to kids. But when you see films like Gang Boy or like Age 13, there's a compassion and a concern for kids that um, is much greater than society usually voices. Gang boy is a phenomenon of youth. Let's get out of here! He belongs to every race, every creed, and every color. He is a symptom of a sickness in society. We'll get him tonight. Things weren't all roses in the 50s and 60s. That's a message that a lot of people don't want to hear because they want to idealize the past and say that the present is all bad. And it's not true. Um, and I think Sid's films are in a lot of ways documentary proof that uh, 
uh, things weren't so wonderful back then. You know, it's the bad old days theory. Hey, Danny, can I have a word with you? Don't listen to him, Danny. Too late now. Tell him to see the pepper trees. Shut up. Okay, Lieutenant, I'll listen. It wouldn't do no good. I know a truce won't solve the problem, but it will delay the fighting. What do you say? I'll think it over. But one of the juvenile officers from the city of Pomona was telling me a, a case history of uh, the, uh, all this gang warfare they had in their town and how they solved it. And gee, that was very interesting. So I got my writer, Art Swerdlov, and we came out there to the to, Pom to Pomona and uh, we met the boys who were in the gang, from both gangs, the Mexican gang and, and the Anglo gang, and uh, we talked to them and finally got everybody to okay the picture. So I wanted the leader of the gang who made the compromise to be a, a very strong looking Mexican Indian, and they had one in the, in the gang. He just looked sensational. I don't know how good he would have been, but mainly they wanted me to choose Danny. This guy is almost white. They'd rather have him do the play the lead because they wanted him so badly to be accepted. So I took Danny and he turned out to be great. He really did. He was the real leader of the gang. So that was fine too, which made it more truthful. Don't let him grow up trying to find his own way in an angry world he didn't make. Don't let him grow up feeling inferior and unloved. Help him to become recognized and accepted by the community. A real part of it. Will you help too? What do you mean? I mean if you boys are willing to help the younger ones, are willing to put all the energy that goes into fighting each other into trying to change the angry world around you, maybe this boy will get his chance. In a way, it may be your chance too, Danny. It turned out to be absolutely a fantastic picture. It was one of the most, the picture I think I really most enjoyed making. I ought to beat the living daylights out of you. Leave him alone. He didn't mean no harm. The way them kids been making fun of him, I'd have done the same thing myself. Age 13, I think, is kind of a homegrown American surrealist film. It's a film about the uh, disturbed and confused mental world, inner world, of a 13-year-old boy who loses his mom. And uh, so much of that movie reminds me of some of these classic uh, surrealist films by Bunuel, like Los Olvidados, especially. That remarkable film, uh, in another context, I think would be seen as, a, as an art film. Listen to me. If your mother were alive, she wouldn't want you to hurt anyone. I know. I'm sorry. I wasn't going to hurt anyone. I wasn't. And Andrew talks his way to health, basically, although it takes quite a while. There's, you know, a uh, a real sympathy and a real sense that kids can be saved. I'm not sure that officially we believe anymore that kids can be saved. We're ready to abandon them. Um, and nobody's abandoning Andrew at that point. 
And in his new home, Andrew showed the first signs of winning his serious inner struggle. Daddy got me a kitten. In this moment, his anger melted, and he found himself capable of returning the love and affection that had been showered upon him, that had in fact given him another chance to live at the age 13. We don't know how to look at these films yet. When it comes to educational films, the level of criticism and understanding and, you know, scholarly study is where feature films were in 1940. So we don't know how to judge. Um, that said, I think uh, we have to look at Sid as an author. You know, if there's an auteur theory still out there in the world, if, if the auteur theory has any validity to it, apply it to Sid. His films um, have, you know, a strongly articulated, a deeply felt and well-expressed, coherently and well-expressed personal vision. And his work may seem very simple and transparent in some ways, but so did Hollywood films in the 30s and 40s. Hollywood films were product cranked out by the studio according to certain formulas. And a number of key people who worked in the studio system were able to infuse, you know, that factory built product with um, aspects of their own personal visions. And I think there's no question that Sid has done that. <laughs> 